join Revolution Radio every Wednesday, 8 p.m. Eastern Time on Studio B for Momentary Zen with host Zen Garcia at freedomslips.com, the people station. This is Thomas, a.k.a. a mad painter. I'd like you to join me Monday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Open Canvas. Don't forget to bring an open mind. Yes, folks, that's right. Bring an open mind to an open canvas. Again, that is Monday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern. UFOs to government corruption. This is Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. We did not engage in conflict that was out of line with our mission. Is it disloyal? Is it sedition? Is it treason to oppose the hands of tyranny? Never! I will never send troops anywhere on a mission of that kind without telling them that if somebody shoots at them, they can darn well shoot back. No, no, of course. Of me. But as for me, give me liberty! Oh, give me dark cloud is finally lifting across the world as U.S. military intelligence and their global partners are destroying the deep state criminal power structure that has ruled over our planet for hundreds of years. We are free with the God-given rights and we shall not yield that right to any power on earth. Hi, I'm Scott McKay. The world is at, and I am your host on The Tipping Point. On Revolution Radio, where every Monday from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern, we bring you the latest in this ensuing takedown of this global criminal empire. That's an image of strength. You'll get the raw, hard truth here on The Tipping Point. So come join us Mondays, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern, in Studio B at Revolution.Radio. This is the People's War. It is our war. We are the fighters. Fight it, then. Fight it with all that is in us. And may God defend the right. Warning, warning. We gotta stop them. They're gonna kill us all. See how the trouble you've started? Be they the government, be they industry, be they organized labor, be they anyone, or human beings. Time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious. Makes you so sick at heart that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to win the day to the people who run it, to the people who own it. That unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. Revolution Radio of FreedomSlips.com, the number one listener-supported talk radio station, throwing ourselves upon the gears of the machine. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. You call down the thunder, well now you've got it. Right. You tell them I'm coming, and hell's coming with me, you hear? Hell's coming with me! Revolution Radio! Mini Ice Age Conversations Podcast. It's about observing cycles, sharing insights, and solving problems together by combining historical, climate, food, and economic data so you can make informed decisions as we shift into a new era. Here's what was, this is what's coming. Our world is never going back to 2019, so what will the new era look like? And most importantly, what is immediate that will affect the pocketbook and the outlook into next year so we can all get ready? Thank you for joining. I'm your host, David Dubine. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are on this beautiful blue planet. What a wonderful existence we have to see the changes occur in front of us. It's so out in the open and so blatant that we're going through a massive change that is no longer be hidden. In any way, shape, or form, we're looking at it from the monetary system to the political system to the food-growing system and the availability of foods at a cheap price. 
I mean, you know, we've jumped the shark. We are definitely falling off the cliff. We're like that one. What was that road runner getting chased and the coyotes hanging in the midair? Well, we're about to, you know, you get that split second before the drop occurs. And I think that one split second where the drop will occur is happening in September. The way we look at it all around, it is a bizarro, but a very interesting world. Very interesting world, I must say. Here with Ransom Godwin tonight, 420 TV, Freedomist Films, slash Mountain High. Ransom, what are you seeing in the in the the near future? You know, we can look in the rearview mirror and go, wow, everything compressed in on itself. You know, like you watch one of those disaster movies. And somebody looks in the rearview mirror and they're like, yeah, all the accidents and erupting volcanoes and Godzilla stepping within a couple feet of the end of the car as you look back in the mirror, you know? So where do we go from here? Proof of space and time. I think I think I'm gonna agree with the Whole Food CEO right now of what's what's going on right now. John Mackey there says he's worried the socialists are taking over. I think he's a little late to the game. Um, I think that's already been happening. I think the, the whole political thing you're seeing right now is the remnants uh, of the last little bit of the, the uh, people that are in charge right now. Whoever runs Biden, I don't think that he does much except for, uh, you know, takes a couple drugs when they need him to take a speech. Uh, maybe that's a conspiracy theory. We're in a weird time, too, now where you, you really got to watch your tongue or the uh, secret police may be knocking on your door at 2 o'clock in the morning on something you said. And and I've we've kind of joked around the last couple of years, uh, you know, saying, wow, that's crazy happening over in Spain and in the U.K., et cetera, Australia, New Zealand. But uh, now we're starting to see that from the top down here in the U.S., uh, our law systems don't seem to work. They're only they're only uh, you know working one one way for one one agenda, and that's it. And that's the same agenda that wants to keep everybody on lockdowns and uh, for the foreseeable future. But um, they've set it up now where it's just going to be because you're bad and and you're bad for the planet. So we got to keep you corralled in, you know. And and then that's the perfect time to uh, let everybody know that they're going to be cutting the world's. Uh, lifestyle back to a ration form that that's what i'm seeing going on plus i've had the beauty of finally getting the covid uh since i talked to you last thursday ironically i got i got really sick after the i guess i got it through the uh, airwaves no i'm just kidding somehow or another our whole family got it and it uh it put us down for a couple days but i i can't imagine the alternative of uh you know the some of the things that might go wrong let's say shall we say if uh I would have got myself protected and did all the things that they told me to. I'd still be here today. Uh, a week later, I broke the fever. It's all good. Now I have natural immunity. I don't know if you're allowed to say that, but I'm, I'm actually a little bit happy that I came across it. But it does uh, make me keep wondering because more and more evidence comes out that it may not be a natural um a, a natural path on the virus. Let's put it that way. Um, so who knows what happened? Uh, it kind of makes me wonder what what did everybody what happened to everybody in the last two years while they kept us distracted with uh, how far they could push authoritarianism. It looks like pretty far, and from what's going on in our national news there with uh, that, I, I don't know what it, it seems like a show to me. It always has, but between the Republicans and Democrats right now, it seems like there's only going to be one party come 2024. Well, you know, I got, I got an answer for you. It might be a little kind of woo-woo for the answer of what happened during the last two years during the lockdown. Terraforming at the Uber levels. And terraforming can take on many different ways, shapes, and forms. Now, we were told that air traffic was at a minimum, but I remember seeing daily uh, stratospheric aerosol geoengineering being dispersed across the blue skies of natural love from God that gave us this tinge of blue and healthy air to breathe. Even though there was almost no air traffic, how were there so many persistent contrails up there during that time? And then the amount of 5G being rolled out next to schools, like school was out forever. And now that all the kids are back in, there is a 5G tower next to every single school. And, you know, terraforming takes water, earth, air, frequency, and vibration so 
During that time, it seems the vibratory pattern of the planet had been hijacked and slightly altered to the point where everybody just felt off because the frequency of the planet is just off. I think the elite or the scientists trying to create terraforming machines are in a way trying to balance or nullify the electromagnetic changes from the sun and the effects it's having on our magnetosphere. The cosmic ray density, the awareness, the change in just energetics of the human and the surroundings around us. And when I look at terraforming, and you know, they talk all, and I have seen like five or six different stories about alien invasions. Who was it that said, we're going to need better weapons, we're going to need a global government to battle the aliens, and it's just this ridiculous things all in this last week, specifically about off earth threats that we're going to need to assess and get on everybody on the same page. And, you know, Ransom, you and I talked about a couple weeks ago, but when I'm looking at it, terraforming, who would they be preparing the planet for and what type of life form would it be? So you ask me the question, you know, what was going on in the last two years that we couldn't see? Now, the best way to terraform or do other Changes that would be in plain sight would be have everybody stay inside so they couldn't see the changes taking place. So, you know, have to be inside from this certain time to this certain time. You're not allowed out in this sector of the city. Everybody's locked down. This, You know, what did go on in terms of physical changes to the physical environment around us during those last two years? And, and there's a bevy of these things coming out now. And, you know, as we go through tonight's show, how many times can we have a once in a thousand year flood occur? We got nine instances of once in a thousand year flood just in the last week alone. It rained so heavy that buildings collapsed in Yemen. Not because the flood was actually rolling through somebody's front living room. It's because the rain was so heavy and they live in these more remote villages in mud brick homes, which are generally incredibly tough. And once that stuff breaks or, you know, bakes solid, it's as hard as concrete, I'm telling you. But it rained so much that nothing could hold its form any longer and buildings just collapsed because they got so wet and soggy. An 8x increase in rainfall up in Pakistan, you know, and then Kentucky. And then 300-year rainfall in Japan, which was all-time record rains. And then South Korea and Seoul, they had uh, years where they ran in a day. And, you know, just these unbelievable events going across the planet. Death Valley twice in two weeks. A year's worth of rain in just a, a single couple hours, twice in two different instances. It's just getting a little absurd where nothing can be hidden any longer. And you, you see that this distraction that's being put forth in front of us is nothing more than to hide from the fact that regardless if you're a good citizen, regardless of what you're doing, availability of food in the world we understand in a stable fashion without having electrified skies, plasma discharges, and food being wiped out at every single turn that we look, including the blight that is ripping through this area in the country. It is so difficult not to keep your tomatoes or beans alive. This, the blight is everywhere. It is so rainy and so wet that blight has just wiped out an enormous amount of crop here in East Tennessee. Now, you know, people are afraid of some things. An armed IRS agent, yeah, that's a little scary. Not being able to eat because your weather's so unstable and I don't care how much carbon tax. And Oh, by the way, they forgot to tell you it's a 2,000-year cycle or 4,000-year cycle we're repeating right now. And not everybody's going to eat. I don't know. These are the things that are happening starkly in front of us, but it goes right back to that terraforming. So I'm wondering what happened in the terraforming era that has given us such massive floods or – were they riding on top of the electromagnetic changes to create even larger floods where we'd be only be seeing once in a 200 to once in a 500 year storm now, but whatever this is, terraforming on top of is creating a doubling or tripling amplification effect to destroy even more food in addition. And I saw there was another flour milling company that went up in flames un unknown why just a couple of days back. But it's all encompassing ransom. It just keeps coming and snowballing and larger. And I just can't believe not a lot of people see their food supply disappearing in front of them right now. Yeah, and then you could uh, – how likely do you think it is for uh, Europe to start having floods now that uh, 
a lot of their farmland, vineyards, et cetera, is all being covered with supposed fires from whatever whatever's causing the fires. Uh, that makes it just perfect for flash floods and things like that to come later, um, which would wash away more soil. But there's a whole area. I'm showing a picture uh, for those of you guys watching on Rumble and other stuff. Um, all these fires through France, Spain, um, Italy, Belgium, they're all out of water while other people are getting flooded. Um, but we've talked many times about, um, you know, the other things that you would be seeing if there was some terraforming going on. And, you know, you can count up destruction of farmland. And by the way, um, you know, they, Bill Gates, they've been uh, powdering the atmosphere with reflectance. They didn't ask permission from anybody. They've just been doing it. Uh, and they've been doing that for years. They've been doing they've had different projects going on. There's like uh, one in New Mexico where they were putting out sulfur particles. Um, but there's another one where they're using these uh, stratospheric injections to put out all of these. I, I forgot what it's made out of, um, but it's a really reflective material. So they're trying to blot out whatever uh, sun's coming. And I think we, we were on to it last time. I think that they know that there's a cooling trend coming. And they want to be in a position where they say, look, we did that. We saved the planet. We also came out with all of our, you know, fast growing um, GMO foods to replenish the food for the masses. Um, it, it's all a culmination of all of that. Plus uh, what I've mentioned before, they're getting into a position where they're not really needing the massive amounts of workforces in the world anymore. They now can have robotics. They can grow people. They can um um, keep the people that know how to do things that are existing now um, kind of in a little cage with the social credit system where they have to be a good person and do all of these different things in order to be seen right by the uh, political groups that are in charge now. And from one, one end of the planet to the other end, I'm seeing the same thing, and that's a communistic style uh, gov top-down governing um, where they just tell you what's going to happen and you better do it. And it seems like that's reached the United States, too. It's kind of hard to argue that it hasn't. Um, what I do think it ironic is uh, the CDC just put out their new guidelines, which is to not quarantine and not six foot and all of that stuff. Just do basically do whatever you want now. Um, and that shows you about how much, uh, you know, the previous uh, stuff that they were doing really meant anything to them. It seems like it's all been an experiment or a distraction, like you say, while they get certain things done while no one's paying attention. And one of those seems to be the destruction of the worldwide food supply um, so that all of the little countries and the, and the people in those countries will bend the knee and do whatever they're told to do so that they can get their rations. Um, it's always been about food. And I keep seeing more and more of these uh, cannibal things, which is, I don't know if they're just putting that out there you know, to, uh, like, like you said earlier, kind of tone down the uh, vibratory uh, existence that we have and make it to a more negative vibration when people are worried about all of these things. And then you throw, um, you know, the wars that seem to be lining up uh, in Europe. And it, it seems like we're, we're about to come to a head. And it's ironic. Um, while I was sick, I was watching a couple sci-fis. And it, I, the, the dates always come up, um, whether you're watching uh, Star Trek or what it is, the time that they pick in these sci-fis uh, for the Earth to change to no longer go back to what it was before. So it's like a pivotal change that changes us forever. They keep using the year 2024, and uh, I keep hearing the year 2030 as by the time it's finished being implemented. So. I, I don't know if that's just being put out there in the human psyche or it's just a, there's some people in Hollywood that, uh, you know, are, are hearing the same things we're doing and they're using the same dates or it's a more of a predictive programming to just steadily incrementally get everyone used to these new systems. And uh, the alien thing would be so easy for them now. Um, they now control every, every idea that there is out there. They even control what's considered a fact or not. You're not allowed to have uh, opinions about things or theories. Uh, and you notice that the government and the authoritative sources, like the mainstream medias, um, ha from the top down seem to have been on this, uh, not to coin uh, info wars, but an information war um, against people. And it seems like they're winning that war now uh, in the way that they're destroying anyone that finds a way around um, their censorship. 
So if they can't censor you, they'll destroy you monetarily or just, you know, delete you completely to the memory hole. And if they can't do that, then they'll start using uh, criminal um, agencies to start messing with people. And that seems like what the goal is right now. They've done everything they can to set us up for some kind of civil war. And it seems like they just keep feeding the fire with these very vague things that are going on in Washington back and forth. And it it seems nothing more to me than a giant show distraction. So terraforming, I would agree with that because everything that these scientists get together and then the governments follow, uh, none of them seem to be for the benefit of a human being living on the earth and uh, living off of the earth. They all seem to be ways to destroy those systems. So everybody needs to double down now and, uh, you know, figure out ways, nooks, crannies, and ways to uh, have new bartering systems and and coming up with their own supplies. We just need to cut these overlords off uh, and show them, you know, something like when the patriots in in the 1700s started, uh, you know, drinking coffee instead of tea just as one little thing uh, to take power away from people. Um, and there's many examples of that. I mean, we've known for a long time we could vote with our dollar, but I think it's becoming more and more important while money still exists in the way that it does, that we use it to not only set up um, systems for survival for ourselves, but, um, you know, eliminate the funds that these people get from the people they're trying to destroy, which is us. So it's weird how they make us pay for our own destruction. Um, by implementing their new rules uh, through economics, whether it's high gas prices, whether it's, uh, you know, making you pick and choose certain brands at the store. Uh, imagine not having to do that. Imagine just having to grow stuff that's been the same thing everyone's been eating for thousands of years. Um, I, I think the money's in the seeds and books. It's a weird time we're going in, but seeds, books, and uh, other things like that are just going to be the way that things go forth if you're going to have any kind of autonomy of uh, individual freedom or, or you're going to be stuck in the system and have no choice but to eat the things they feed you and to think what they they want you to think it, it's a really scary system that's uh it's here it's no longer in the future we're living in it i see it every day now yeah 2024 i'm going to throw a a term out here cultural layer now, I was on the InfoWars show today with Mike Adams in the final hour because he was co-hosting for Alex Jones. So we had a chat, but earlier in the day I talked with somebody and we got into this deeper discussion. And Rance, remember when we were talking about low magnetic fields, having a child born into that lower magnetic field would extend their lifetimes. So when we were talking, I had found this huge image collage just yesterday evening off a of telegram on hidden history, I think is the, the name of the telegram channel, where the whole entire, you know, 15, 20 images before and after were all about cultural layering. So we were talking about low magnetic fields, another incredibly low magnetic field, maybe once in a 2000 year low magnetic field or a complete canceling magnetic field on our planet should occur somewhere around October of 2024. But with this, is absolutely going to be some sort of earth cataclysm in terms of global liquefaction or what others term as a mud flood. Simple as that. When we get to this state where there's two competing magnetic fields, one goes really low, the other strengthens, and then uh, magnetic coupling occurs from a different point, this, uh, the crust squeezes just like a tube of toothpaste. It elongates. It turns into an ellipsoid, or it rebounds from the ellipsoid back into its circular format before uh, gravity can take back over and then spin it out, because you know the equator is higher than the poles. And if you were to stop the rotation of the Earth, uh, there would be land that would sink at the equator, and there'd be other land that would bulge out further in the North Atlantic or the South uh, part of our world, and you know that's what the New Zealand stories of how the islands were created and they're created in myth and legend, which is so similar to what would happen if the Earth stopped rotating. New lands would just lift out. You know, you saw it in that movie 2012, where at the end of the movie they go, "Well, the Drakensberg Mountains are now the tallest mountains in the world," and that's in South Africa. So, see, the Earth 
when it had stopped or whatnot and all those huge waves came when the earth started re-rotating it would have shifted some number of degrees and when it came back to that ellipto ellipsoid again there's extreme versions of it like you would consider that movie 2012 which i firmly believe they'd have thousand foot waves rolling across continents absolutely it's so many myths and legends talk about that we could even say see it looking at google earth look at western africa you can see where the water poured off that continent after it rose out of the water even more. But if you want to come to a light version of that same electromagnetic effect, you would call it a mud flood. Now, the entire Earth's surface in so many places, not all, but a huge, huge, gigantic, more than, I would say, 70% of the Earth's surface would have a new layer built on it. It would ooze from the ground, and it could be a combination of sand, anywhere from 3, 10, 15 feet deep that would spread out to actual mud mixed with water and flows or silt and these sort of things would just pile on top of the land. or And that would also be mountains that would be moving in a liquefaction format where mountain ranges, the top part of it would skid down the mountain and bury anything below it. So back to the cultural layers. These seem to overlap with a couple of things, the change of the way the human is ruled on the planet. The overseership of this farm we call Earth, the management system for humanity on Earth as a farm, changes along with these global liquefaction events. But what's so interesting is once humanity is wiped back to whatever it gets set back to because of this event, you know, there's a huge loss of life, but there's pockets of people. They continue to live. They start connecting with other pockets of people, and eventually, after 100 years perhaps after this, humanity starts to reemerge. They start to build again, and they just build right on top of the remnants. But even if they, don't, they didn't know they were there originally, and then bring it up another 100 or 200 years when the cities are finally big enough, where they're expanding after 200 years, that they dig down and they find this whole other layer beneath it. Usually more advanced in the architecture, like the ones I'm looking at here, Everything that was below had nice curved archways. Everything was arches, good feng shui, nice smooth columns. But then the layers above it are all square windows and square columns and square doors. Very not feng shui at all, very uh, alien. But these cultural layers go hand in hand with changes of rulership on the planet on how, the, how humanity is managed as a herd, much like cattle herd the human herd. Vibration frequency is changing, so the, the way we perceive reality would change. Like, if you were to take Ransom and me and just a general person and put them back in the 1400s with the Spanish Inquisition, we would all instantly say no, and that would stop. Because that management system doesn't fit today's energy frequency. So then you start to couple all these together, and you look at the new sets of monetary system, like the disappearance of entire uh, civilizations and societies, and then stories are made up of how they disappeared, why they just when they disappeared. But the one thing that's common across the entire planet is cultural layer. It is a global phenomenon. We find it earlier. It's better built. And even when they go really deep, which they don't like to, but when they go levels down, there's another layer below that at points where where we have built on top is a second rebuilding on top of the layers prior. Each one of those at probably a 400-year interval. How humanity can be rewritten and how time and history can be rewritten so quickly. I don't, look at that. You, you talked about rewriting. You silence people enough, and within one generation, you could change history. Two generations, for sure. Like my grandparents' era, what happened during the Great Depression in a firsthand account very few people alive. The only thing left is historians to tell us what happened. That's, was not, that's not even 100 years ago. So go back 400 years. And me being a historian and doing all the research, it's very difficult to find very solid information because you get two different accounts of the exact same account. You get who was the winner, who was the loser? Who was the viewer? Was the viewer on the loser's side or was the viewer on the winner's side to report on what happened? You got to say, they're looking at the exact same thing, but you get... Six sets of reports of the exact same event. So which one is true? But whatever is coming, the global 
governance system or the, the governments on the planet realize that there is not a thing that can be done. Nothing. So the best thing for them to do is create enough chaos, just enough, just enough to keep things going, but everybody deflected and uh, occupied and distracted. While at the same time, whatever limited time's left, things are being swooped and sent for continuity of government across the planet, in which form that takes for each government is going to be different where they store, whether it be under the sea, in caves, on mountaintops, whatever. It's different for everyone. But, you know, looking through these cultural layers, that is the biggest thing. The monetary system, the governmental overseership, and then society itself is on this cycle. And we're coming back into it. So, Ransom, I would definitely agree 2024 fits that bill. Now, the, the thing is, though, 2024, if we were to have a liquid faction event, there would be enough people around and say, 2030, 2033, 2035 to reset the system to begin it again from the remnants of who is left after that eight to 10 year period. So a lot of these things I'm looking at in terms of what it will be are meant for whoever gets through this period into 2032, 33. But then I'm wondering, well, how will the electronics work if they're gonna go to CBDCs when a huge amount of the infrastructure on the crust of the planet in the top mile or so is gonna be completely destroyed, covered, buried, rifted, ripped, cracked, and just broken into smithereens. So perhaps it's all an illusion to create the illusion that we're going into, but really it's all because they know the collapse wall is here. I don't know if I should call it a collapse layer, a cultural layer, or what it is, but there's got to be different levels for it. I don't know how to really term it, but I'm just using the cultural phrase here, cultural layer. Yeah, that sounds legit. Besides that, that's... That's how we know all of the European powers worked when they went to all around the world. You can include North America, South America. Some of the first things they did when they got there is find the older sites that were slightly buried in dirt and build a church on it, build a you know city center on it, um, et cetera, et cetera, aiding in the, uh, erase, the erasing of previous histories. Um, I wanted to ask you, I sent you a link and this is just, you know, kind of woo-woo too, but you're talking about some major events as far as a planet goes, uh, mudslides, et cetera. And I kind of wanted to ask you some stuff about that uh, to give us a, you know, a kind of a picture of what that would look like. So I sent you this link to a huge sinkhole open up in the Chilean mm -hmm. desert. And uh, it, when you look at that, it looks exactly like, uh, you know, the holes that are showing up in the tundra in Siberia, et cetera, and some other places around the world um, where there's these, it, it almost looks like somebody just took a, uh, you know, a core sample of the planet and took off with it. Um, but I know that what this is, is a big uh, opening underneath it that once uh, was full of uh, sediment and stuff and then has moved because water has moved underneath uh, the top the top layers of earth there and you just see it sink through um you know when you're talking about these mudslides and things moving sometimes there's these giant pockets of water uh from aquifers that are locked into place um that are uh you know they're not quite at sea level they're above sea level so you can imagine if some of these cracked or sinkholes opened up and things started shifting around like you're talking about could we see just like floods pop up in the middle of nowhere um, where there is no rain or anything, it's because it's the groundwater breaking through and everything rearranging. And how many of more of these these type of holes uh, would show up when things are moving, like you're talking about? Because I know on one end you might have a mud slide, um, but every for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction of uh, rearrangement. So when things are rearranging, it it makes these voids, pockets, and uh, room for other things to also move into place. So how much of this do you think um, if an event like this was happening, would we see like cities and, and, and things like that? You kind of mentioned the end of that uh, movie where, you know, the whole top crust is moving around and going up and other places are sinking down. But what about just these basic ways of uh, basic hydrodynamics where water moves sediment? Because if you've ever been anywhere in the desert and you've seen a flash flood, you know that you could come out into an area that you know very well, and then all of a sudden it ain't there anymore. There's a giant arroyo that's never been there before, or a giant sinkhole that just appeared when the uh, you know the sand layer 
uh, the clay layer collapsed in on it. Um, you know, can you imagine how much disruption in farmland? Because every time I see one of these, um, especially this one right here that I'm uh, showing people in Chile, it's right smack dab in the middle of a farming area, and it, it is big. There's some uh, buildings next to it that are like warehouse uh, size buildings. And uh, can you imagine just like uh, your whole farm is sitting on this and then it's gone? I mean, literally, it just disappeared beneath your feet. And if this would happen into a city area, which I'm sure there's nothing stopping that from happening, if the same scenarios are happening, you might see cities just disappear overnight with uh, mud floods, sinkholes, et cetera. And this is just from a, a little bit of different pool uh, on the magnetic fields, uh, you know, kind of contorting on Earth. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, in, in the physical form of magnetism. But what you're seeing was, I'm, I'm going to say, a direct reflection of electric activity. You know, those, well, you reference those perfectly round cylindrical holes that are appearing all over the tundra. That's electric, too. There's no possible other explanation for it. Electric. Because if you look at electric arcing, and Billy over, uh, you know, with the suspicious observers, Billy Yell uh, Yellerton, when he was doing all those lab experiments with the anode cathode, where they would put a different substrate in there, like clay, for example, or, or sand, or whatever it would do, and then they would hit it with, you know, incredibly high voltage it would have these perfect arcing holes on it. And then electric geology stems right from that. And you can look at the Thunderbolts project on a huge array of information on what happens with the electrical scarring. Electrical discharges off the main bolt on those side jumps of the littlest, what they do, everything is perfect circles. And what you might consider craters on some of the heavenly bodies, uh, bodies in our solar system are actually electrical scarring. And the perfect circle thing is a thing. And you look at that, 650 feet deep of a perfect circle. So if you're looking at Earth's magnetic field, an overcharge on our crust, this ground to sky lightning. Now, what happens if it starts to hollow out every time there's a discharge on a ground to sky event? I mean, 650 feet deep, that would swallow an enormous amount of almost every city's high skyscrapers. Because if you go across America, except for places like maybe LA or some place downtown Atlanta, or uh, New York, something like this, generally you're not going to get buildings that are over 60, 70 stories tall. It just generally doesn't happen. Like you think about that, 70% of all the tallest buildings in every single city in America would have been underground. Now what you're seeing at 65 feet wide, or no, it was a lot wider than that, it was 650 feet deep. But what happens if this does turn into a mile wide chasm because the stories of old and the lore and whatever you might consider it a legend and a story of quacky old you know cave people whatever you classify that as talk about the top mile of the crust rifting and becoming uh, jelly for the better term of it oh and i'll tell you a story if we go back into the new madrid quake Early 1800s. That's not long ago. That was like, you think about the early 1800s compared to where we sit now. That's not even, it's about a 200 year gap between that. Now, during the New Madrid quake, which registered, the best they can say is like an 8.7 to a 9.0 rate along the Mississippi River. 10,000 square miles up and down that river were inundated and filled with sand to the point they could not farm there until they flattened all the sand volcanoes out. Rivers ran backward. New ponds were formed. Instant uplift of anywhere from 10 to 30 feet created new cliffs. It took them 70 years to get that flat enough again from, let's say, 1816 all the way through, you know, 1890s, early 1900s to get that flat enough to farm again. Because of the sand volcanoes, and I came across some incredible images of the aftermath of the sand volcanoes, and this was in like in the 1850s of areas they hadn't flattened yet. It was just so all-encompassing. And you got to think about that rudimentary technology. They didn't have tractors, and they were trying to do all this by hand. Now, easy today, but if we were to get set back and another one of these events came and the whole entire ground surface 
was filled by something, but you knew you were in prime farmland, you'd probably try to get it flat again because you know you're in prime farmland. But how long would that take? Successive generations. And maybe all these stories of what we've been told about them breaking the sod out west is really just reflattening what had been upwelled or uplifted from a global liquefaction event. You know, history is very strange and unusual. But I would have to say, Ransom, that the size of what we're seeing now, even though it might be the world's largest or the most amazing or the deepest that has been recorded to this point, I think is a very light version of what's to come in less than a year and a half to two years. Uh, I'm really caught like half mile wide chasms to form like that. And if you look over around Asia, this happens everywhere. It is very common for these sinkholes to open up from Hong Kong to Taipei. Places across China are littered with them. People walking along and they just fall through uh, sidewalks. It is so common in Asia because it's so densely built over that if a sinkhole opens up, well, in the States or in Canada, you're probably not going to have a house over it. But if you covered the whole entire east coast of Asia with megalopolises and cities for, you know, hundreds of miles where you never leave a city, it, when sinkholes open up, you know, they, they're visible. They cause damage. It's in the middle of a city. So to answer that question in a very long-winded way, absolutely. Think of Noah. The stories were not just above ground firmament breaking and causing such the floods from the sky, but the below the earth opened up and those, you know, a thousand foot geysers came shooting out of the earth. You know, I'm starting to ask and question, was that a global liquefaction event? And that was already cataloged as one, what you could expect with water coming from beneath the feet out of the earth. Because the same exact thing as I envision of that would happen if it was mud like toothpaste or if it was water like you're talking about. Because if you get that aquifer cut into deep enough, you're going to get exactly what was described in the flood of Noah during the cataclysmic event. The water will come from beneath just magically out of nowhere and spurt thousands of feet into the air. That would be a disruptor on a Tuesday morning, wouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's the kind of things that, um, you know, no one's going to plan for those kind of things. So if, if, you if can. the government it's impossible. Hits, yeah. It's impossible to so plan. You really it, can't. Right. Um, e so even if government entities knew these things were going to happen, I doubt seriously they would actually start to warn people that they lived in susceptible areas to, you know, because you don't see um, the government telling people in California that constantly has mudslides, on, you know, uh, right on the coast that they can't million, build their million dollar homes there. Instead, they just let them. Uh, keep building new stuff, and then it falls into the ocean. Then they build some more a little further back. Um, so, so it's not like that there would be any kind of warnings of this. The the powers that be would just let things go the way that they go. And I kind of wanted to talk about if something did happen, and, and we're seeing a lot of uh, weird activity in Europe. Um, and I, and I imagine in the near future there's going to be some fights over food and resources uh, from the people, not the governments themselves, but from the people when things start being reorganized. And uh, I, I wanted to mention, like I was saying, I, we were kind of watching sci-fi while we were sick, and uh, I came across this show called the, it's it, it's a multi-language show out of Europe, I guess, but it's got Russian, German, etc. And the premise is something happened in 2024. Um, but whatever it was, it, it totally turned off the power grid to the whole planet. So everybody instantly is back in the Stone Age. Now, they don't start the show there or show you, you know, the uh, the way that they had to deal with it or anything. Instead, they skip to like 2060 or something like that, where um, it's all complete. And the name of it is called the Tribes of Europa. And basically what it's about is the remnants of governments fighting over the resources, food, farmland, et cetera, and the little factions that they have, the Crimson faction and the, uh, you know, there's uh, a different faction that acts all crazy and they have slavery and all kinds of things that look like the old world that we used to have, but except for it's uh, all aligned on new political things. But it doesn't really seem that far-fetched that if the governments weren't in control of things, that there would be little tribes of uh, different groups of people fighting to control what there is. And um, 
that happens with or without governments anyway. So what do you think is going to happen through the bread belt? Because basically what I'm seeing is fires, flooding, and the government destabilization on the entire part of Europe that feeds Europe and a good portion of some of the rest of the world. And then when you look over here in the U.S., uh, we have plenty of our own problems. We have corporations buying up all of the farmland. We have um, people pay, paid to not grow. They, they, I mean, we've we've seen a lot of food destruction um, in the past couple of years, you know, where they've destroyed their food that they've had. Uh, and now now they're trying to claim that things are so hot in a normal summer that, you know, their cattle are dying. I mean, the excuses of why things aren't being produced are incrementally increasing, and they all tie into climate control. Uh, or excuse me. Yeah, well, that's uh, that was a Freudian slip, but that, that's what they want, climate control. Uh, and they have all these little uh, projects going around um, pretending that they are, in fact, controlling the, the climate or at least trying to give their self minor credit for fighting climate change. Um, so I've been looking at the temperatures, you know, just to get a baseline because I'm not really into all of that stuff like other people are, like I'm sure you are. You know a lot of facts and figures. But I was just looking at the overall temperature change from like 1970 to, to 2000, and, and it, it hasn't changed not even one degree averagely. So there's really been no climate change whatsoever. So if any climate change did start to happen because of, uh, you know, the, the place we are in space, um, the way the sun is acting right now, our magnetic sphere, all of these uh, factors, how would people actually react? And would that be like the absolute proof from the governments that they were right the whole time uh, and that their programs are what's, uh, you know, keeping you fed right now? Because that's what it seems like, that they're hijacking a natural cycle in order to take credit for whatever happens, whether it's good or bad, they want to control it. Uh, and how, how do you get around that? And how do you um, just remember that it, it's all nonsense? Because if the do, only one degree difference in that amount of time that they've been, they've gone from the story of global cooling to the story of global warming to now they don't want to use those terms because it's so easy to get you on the temperatures and the and whether or not the ocean is actually rising and things like that. Um, if something did happen where an amount of water from like, uh, you know, the, the land masses let go and actually added an amount of water, you would have to imagine that this is a lot of water. And that's, that's what indeed they say. There is an ocean under the crust that's, uh, you know, like what, a hundred times bigger than the amount of ocean water on the surface. If that were to crack open, or be exposed in some way, um, you would have one of two things. You'd have like the ocean sinking down and, and uh, mixing with that water or that water coming out on land. Um, how easy would it be for them to now take control of the entire narrative and convince people that they did that? It's like the opposite of uh, what Moses did, you know, like uh, Moses uh, got, got his little staff and God gave him the power to do this and that. And he found water and, did these other things and later he took credit for it, you know, and he got punished. But this is like the opposite of that. It's like uh, the governments are now going to take uh, credit or or give blame uh, based on what happens. And I don't think they know exactly what's happening. Uh, and I did catch that was ironic. I woke up this morning and saw you on Infowars and uh, you were getting into a lot of these earth changes that we, we can see in relatively short amount of time. In other words, our lifespan. Um, how is that going to fit in with with actually growing food around the world if no one knows what uh, places are stable, I guess is my question. How are they going to know which places are stable or do they already know? And does that go back into the fact that uh, you've been paying attention and keeping track of the, uh, I, I guess I should say, commercial and, uh, you know, heavy business that's been being put into North Africa, knowing that there's a giant water supply there that they can tap. Um, do you think they know exactly the places that are going to go drought, the places that are going to be flooding and the places that they can uh, manipulate grow fields where they will be the only controllers of food on the planet, so to speak? Yes, yes, yes. And maybe, and I'll answer those in a row in the possible. 
but the amount of water in the Earth's crust is 3x more than there is on all the oceans, rivers, lakes combined on the surface. That's been well established for such a long time. At least 3x. And that's what they can know and actually measure so far with what we consider as the highest tech um, you know, available to penetrate through it, through the crust using satellites and uh, ground penetrating. I'm not even going to say radar any longer, but the ability for them using what they do for oil exploration now to go below those layers. You know, we're talking 30 miles down into the crust, and they're able to see pockets of water. So, okay, as far as we can penetrate down there now, we know with the minimum there's 3x as much water under the crust as there is above. So anything that happens that penetrates through that crust, there's going to be water everywhere. Absolutely. And the food growing, you know, think about that, the citadel. I kept hearing this thing way back in the day called the Bitcoin Citadel, and it fits pretty much with what you spoke of right there. That's why it kind of keyed my memory on that. If you knew where the stable food growing zones where you would set up zones there or take over zones and then have those as what we consider like an old citadel, like a fortified citadel. Story goes, if you had any Bitcoin, like three-tenths of a Bitcoin, one Bitcoin, half a Bitcoin, whatever, you could go and live in one of these places and you'd be taken care of for the rest of your life. Well, if you knew where the food growing was going to be, you could at that point just set up there in advance knowing that it would be there. And suddenly you control the food and the water and access to the water. Yeah, North Africa is a goodie. Uh, if you could use the below ground water resources in the Nubian aquifer, which stretches, I don't know how many cubic, we're talking cubic kilometers of water. I think there's something like 2 million cubic kilometers of water just in the few countries in the North African region up there. Because I know for sure that under Libya, that they'd cataloged at least 19,000 cubic kilometers of fresh water that could be pulled. And it was a replenishment basin because it was coming off the Mediterranean Ocean. And there were like different several layers of uh, sediment that would filter that. So it'd be purified by the time it got down into... Uh, was like the southeast quadrant and the southwest quadrant, south central of Libya coming off the Mediterranean further down into the Sahel. But then as you go all the way through the Sahel region and you're bordered by all those oceans, and if you look down, it's vast, vast, unbelievably vast aquifers. But you know where the next set largest on the planet is? Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, right on the border right there with China, way out in Xinjiang. That's the second largest set of aquifers on the planet. So if you already knew this, and you could pull the water from there and create new zones, but first you'd have to take credit for it. Like first you'd have to have the disaster and say, hey, there's a disaster, there's a disaster. And then you would have to say, look, we're the gods. We created something to protect you. Look, it works. And we can make it disappear as well. So I'm going to go in and say the Southern Hemisphere was minimum twice as large as the Pinatubo eruption. And if you just want to use fact, the Pinatubo eruption was average height at 20 kilometers, which is like 12 miles, and some of the higher reaches was up to 40 kilometers, which would be about 25 miles in the atmosphere. Well, the Tonga eruption, the highest of the ash, went up to 87, 88 kilometers, which is about 54 miles. Seven-tenths of a degree cooling occurred after Pinatubo. But it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. The larger the eruption, it's more on an exponential form. So we're probably looking around 2 to 2.1 degrees Celsius cooling, which is going to affect all the southern hemisphere crop production. But stay with me on the numbers in the ash here, because it's going to cool the planet 2.1 degrees, especially right now. The southern hemisphere planting season's going to be atrocious, and their yields coming out is going to be almost minimal. Think about a year without a summer, where they're going to experience one right now. In this planting season, when everybody's looking down there to say, please save us, we need the southern hemisphere production because we got the droughts and the floods and the wars and all this stuff in the northern hemisphere. And then along come Bill Gates and Keith, whatever his name is, the, uh, the guy from MIT and the merry band of marauders from Yale and whatnot putting stuff up in the skies. They come along with Gates and they say, we are going to put all these micro balls up there and we're going to reflect the sunlight. We're going to cool the earth. And as soon as it cools with disruption from Tonga, they're going to suddenly go, oh, and by the way, we can take it away too. And then make the temperatures rise back up again because they will naturally after about three years. 
So, you know, they're going to put these stories out like we're cooling it right now. We're the ones who are putting the balls up there. Look how we're, oh, it worked, it worked, it worked. And guess what? Oh, the temperature's cooled. Okay, so as an experiment, we're going to remove the balls right now, and you're going to watch the temperatures warm back up and see how they could play this. And then you start to see how these heat waves and uh, droughts are being bent with ionospheric heaters, and everybody's playing a game. Now, Ransom, you and I, we understand what that means and how it's played and what's going on. So do most people listening to this broadcast, B.E., but what about the general populace who doesn't get in and will go along with the flow of, hey, they're going to put the balls. Hey, the earth should cool. Oh, it's cooled. Wow. Oh, well, it destroyed a few crops. Oh, you know, famine. Let's take the balls away. Look, we can do that too. Or, and they're going to get, we're just getting dragged along. But how many people will believe the stories that are out there? And at the whole time in this collapse period, like where are these zones where they're setting up for stable food growing? I know one of them for sure is Sumba Island in Indonesia. Because it was below the band latitudes where it has really been affected by the ash over the last, say, 1,000 years of eruptions. It's in that sweet spot below the equator. Generally, those volcanoes erupting north of the equator, one or two, three, four degrees in Indonesia. And I'm talking about like two degrees north latitude, but Sumba sits at three degrees or two degrees south latitude. So there's a five degree difference, about 300, 400 miles between the volcanic north and south. So Sumba Island was a goodie. I know that. I know they're setting up in northern Sahel using uh, the, the North African monsoon, pulling more rainfall in along with the underground Nubian and sandstone aquifer and also out near Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan area. And if you notice, all these areas have been in the news lately because they're, they're going to take them over as new grow zones because obviously they know the cycle and where it's going to shift or what will be affected. And these areas shall remain stable. So your history book is your is your future Rama video scope, really. So a history book is your crystal ball. I know it was a long and winded answer, ransom, but I had to go there. Well, that that makes total sense. And uh, when we get back from the break, I kind of wanted to ask you about um, if you pay attention to you know a lot of the stuff that we get force fed it's usually european chinese or american uh, but a lot of people forget that there's whole other groups of civilization like uh, in qatar and saudi arabia that don't seem to be on the same idea as everyone else and they're building these massive cities out in the desert which if you you take you know what it looks like they know that they're going to be in a very stable area and they're setting up these next level technological cities, kind of like what you were referring to as the, you know, the uh, Bitcoin cit citadel that you can live in. That's exactly the kind of things that they're building in certain places. And um, I wanted to know what you think about the the cue that you're getting from the from these different like because China's planning for one thing. You can see that um, Europe and the Americas seem to be picked for destabilization, which um, there, there should be only one reason that you would want to do that is if you wanted to transfer those uh, resource powers over to another place. And who do you think the biggest um, players are going to be um, when things start returning back to a, a normal state, I guess I should say. And I, I think you only got a couple minutes there. We'll get back to that in a second. Yeah, but un until we do get to the break, Saudi Arabia, let's go back into the past. The frankincense route was from Oman and Yemen up the backside, the very west of Saudi Arabia, which is like the empty quarter now out to the west along the Red Sea. Today, it's desert. 800 years ago, it was lush forests. Somebody knows the repeat cycle we're heading into. David Dubai and a ransom guy on here. We'll be back in a couple minutes talk more about ancient history and modern events we'll see you then and then welcome back to many ice age conversations revolution radio studio a you're listening to revolution radio at freedomslips.com we'll be right back after this message
This is Thomas, a.k.a. a mad painter. I'd like you to join me Monday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Open Canvas. Don't forget to bring an open mind. Yes, folks, that's right. Bring an open mind to an open canvas. Again, that is Monday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern. You opposed to government corruption. This is Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. Interested in the paranormal? Murder mystery? Real natural law? Do you enjoy interviews with amazing guests? Then join Crypt Rick every Monday night, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on Revolution Radio. Studio A, freedomslips.com. Crypt Rick's Ivan, thank you. Welcome to the Crypt. <laughs> Join me at Revolution Radio, Studio B, at 11 a.m. on Saturday for free association. When we take a look at philosophy, spirituality, psychology, social issues, and geopolitics. It's every Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern. On Studio B at freedomslips.com. Enter into a world unseen on Raven Star's Witching Hour. You will encounter eclectic topics from the realm of spirit brought into our matrix of truth. With your host, the Solaris Blue Raven. Solaris will bring you an array of unique guests covering topics from ghostly spirits to amazing anomalies, covert technology, UFOs, and shadowy global events. And that's right here at Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, Saturdays, midnight till 2 a.m. Eastern Time. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. Let the magic rise. Galactic Interstellar Council on Revolution Radio Studio A, Fridays at 2 p.m. Eastern. Join us as we traverse the Starseed Paradigm. As expressed in the time space continuum that we know as the divine expression of love and light. Integrating this conscious unity into the galactic paradigm. So welcome all, both terrestrial beings and galactic beings as one. So be it. You're listening to Revolution Radio. Thank you for listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. Any commercial advertising you may hear in this program is of the sole discretion and benefit of the host of whose program you are listening to. Revolution Radio does not endorse any commercial products, nor does it accept monetary compensation for on-air advertising of commercial products, nor will it ever. We are and shall remain 100% listener supported. Any product advertising on this program are considered used at higher risk, and Revolution Radio shall not be held liable for any claims or damages received from any product advertised within this program. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. All right, thanks for listening while we take that short break here at Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. And now we're going to get back to your host. And welcome back for the second hour of Mini Ice Age Conversations. I'm your host right here with Ransom Godwin, 420 TV Freedomist Films. Before the break, we started talking a little bit about 
where are the areas on the planet that are known that would be safe if you knew the transition of how the global climate was going to shift again if you knew in advance where it would become wetter in areas that are incredibly dry right now then you could set societies up there getting ready for the change it's almost like gretzky he was such a good hockey player and i'm not really into sports but the greats of the great like a michael jordan or a wayne gretzky you know if you ever watch them not the game itself but to watch the skill of that person in their art form he would always know where the puck would be and it would be there before it got there that's what made him a winner same thing if you knew as society starts to change based on mappable cycles of time 100 year 400 year 2000 maybe even a 4000 year cycle if you knew it the onset and where it would shift to and you simply just know okay this area is going to get wetter this area is going to get drier how you could reset a society and you're right ransom a lot of areas on the planet governmentally look like they're not working for this transition of resources from one place to another because they're in the place it's already going to be. So the reason they're being set up as such and now bedrocks of the new system is because it's going to shift right there. So why would you create an enemy? They're going to need to go there too to reset the entire system of this planet. And thank you for Revolution Radio allowing us to talk tonight about these subjects. Studio A freedomslips.com if you consider this type of free speech and availability well we can still share ideas on the internet consider a donation did i put myself out this afternoon going on alex jones show to talk about these same issues yep because a lot of people are going to look at that and go all right uh, i saw there was a lot of things about uh there was a huge troll army looking on the social media post to see who was saying this that who was supporting which side who was saying it was bad who was saying it was good who's trying yeah but for sure you know a lot of eyes are on that on the info war site during the day too you know so if you consider free speech in any way shape or form venue or platform is valuable you know keep them going and uh, again there's running cost production costs here at freedomslips.com but the, imagine ransom. I take, can I take you back in history? Because you mentioned Saudi Arabia and that mirrored city in the center there. If you go back in history, 800 years ago, that area of what we know Yemen now, like the Yemen port, if you look down there and zoom in on Google Earth, you're going to see what looks like a V formation of mountains. That if you were to block that off, it would turn into a dam and back the desert up into a super giant lake. Oh, that already happened. It's called the Marib Dam in the year 800 to 1200 AD. That thing was totally full. Marib, M-A-R-I-B Dam in Yemen. If anybody wants to look that up in Google Images and see what it was, the queen of, uh, I forget which queen it was that commissioned that and had overseen the building of it. But as we go through that time period in around the, say, year 400 AD, after the collapse of the Roman Empire, right around 500, their money wasn't so valued because they debased it. There was a kingdom called Aksum that came in in that same exact area in what we know as Ethiopia and Sudan right now that ran up and through Egypt. And on the other side, controlling the frankincense route because they had the cleanest coinage, the cleanest weight and measure of pure gold and silver in their coinage, taking over from the Roman weights measurements of purity. It's called the Aksum, A-K-S-U-M. That area was a buried in milk and honey land because the frankincense route was being run through there. The frankincense plantations were so vast that your eyes couldn't see the end of them. And this is what is now one of the driest places in the world just 800 years ago. I put that in a historical context and these massive floods that have been in Oman, I've done probably five stories of what you consider biblical floods, like seriously, Noah kind of floods have been there in pictures in the last, say, six years. It happens about once a year now. It never happened before. And now it's starting to happen in Yemen where the water coming from the sky is dissolving their, their mud brick 
mud brick buildings because the water's coming out of the sky so heavily. In Oman, there's uh, lakes forming out in the empty quarter, and there's all these new uh, tropical systems that come up through, what's that, the Gulf of Oman there? And it's really becoming wet. And then if you go just across the Red Sea, across one of the driest places on the planet, they built the largest hydroelectric dam there and it completed a couple years ago and it's called the new renaissance dam in that same area on the driest place on the planet you're putting the world you're putting africa's largest newest hydroelectric dam right next to the driest place in africa or are you see if you knew the cycle would shift you know that dam would be completely full at all times and you could have power in northern africa same with all the frankincense root. You could grow as much as you want. You got water enough to grow frankincense trees. You sure got water enough to grow wheat. This is a cycle. Like you know that Saudi Arabia is going to become vast crop fields. Think about Saudi Arabia as the new Kansas. It's got rolling hills. It's gentle. As the rainfalls come, that would wash away. They could use hybrid seeds that grow in sand at the moment until there's much more water and rainfall and it'll turn back to soil again. But in the beginning, what do you think all this GMing is about? It's about changing hybrid seeds to not be able to grow in what we consider loamy soil or clay, but to grow in sand and stress conditions because the transition period's beginning, but it's still going to be a little bit on the sandy side, a little bit on the droughty stressed side in the beginning. But that as that transitions over, it'll be continuous rainfall and we'll have normal rainfall patterns like we do through Kansas every year. Reliable planting and harvesting dates, and you know when the rains come and you know when to plant and harvest. That will happen in Saudi Arabia. Again. And all the way across the Sahel. Jordan will be very uh, lush. If you go back in history and you look along the frankincense route where they came up what you consider the backside of Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt was lush, lush, lush. And then these areas that have been civil war for so long, like Sudan, will become, again, seaside paradises with rolling crops and orchards as far as you can see and drive hundreds of miles south off the coast. This is how it's going to reform. Now, you know that's what the, the, the end result of this change will be. You can identify these areas on the planet where it's going to turn green again, just like I described to you. Another one is going to be Kazakhstan area. And those areas, what you consider really dry right now, like Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, these areas, the stands, under there, they also have a huge amount of aquifers. But if you go back and past as recently as, say, 800 years prior, 1200 A.D., all the oases that were through the deserts that was actually not just like, you know, in our mind, they planted oasis as a desert thing with a pond in the middle and you know, camels came and drank. And, you know, there's a little like two tents around the oasis and that's where the trading was. And that's a no, uh, you, you got to see these oasis in the paintings and things from say, you know, 1000 AD, 1200 AD, there were vast cities around these areas because the oasis allowed so much orchard to be grown around it. But then back then it was not just an orchard and a whole bunch of towns around a little lake growing crops. It was like one super giant, massive green belt from what you consider super dry Western Xinjiang all the way over to what you consider Russia today was just green and fruit-filled milk and honey. It was very different environment. And you know what? China is building one of their biggest hydroelectric dams in the middle of Xinjiang on that same trade route that was the oasis that had the plentiful water to have so much agriculture stretching through the desert, as you would consider Kansas, going from there about a thousand miles west over to Russia through Kazakhstan. And they're China today, right now in 2021 and 22, has just completed their largest hydroelectric dam out west in the country, in the driest place of the country in Xinjiang out there, where it's a desert right now. 
So you cannot tell me that that happened two places on the planet where they put the largest hydroelectric generation dams and stations in the driest places on our planet right now. And somebody doesn't know that there's a shift happening. But for me, it means that it's going to happen way, 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 way faster than the normal of like a normal drip in. Or it might take 50 years to complete this cycle. But maybe we're heading into a very powerful like 4,000 year cooling that will occur in one to two years. You know, and I, that that's the way I'd like to start the second hour ransom. And I know I was trying to answer your question because there was a lot of meaning for me in that resource movement. And, you know, what is the setup and what's known about these places? So I got that. I got real good fact on what I'm talking about. That's why I can speak to it, because I've been making a map of these over the last say, eight years of information I'm collecting about these spots. You know, all of that would make sense because um, in, in the ancient world, like you were talking about, all of these places were lush areas. They had hanging gardens from uh, in the Middle East that uh, took advantage of all the rainfall and things. And then we, we know that there was a lush paradise up and down the Nile River from Sudan all the way to the uh, Delta in Egypt there. So uh, I was looking at Google Earth while you were talking about that. And before you even mentioned China... I was already wondering because you were talking about this uh, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan. Um, this whole area here is really arid. However, um, as you can see, there's some of the largest lakes available um, in the whole area uh, are in these areas, too. But think about this is I'm looking at the map and you look over uh, to the west at the Ukraine, Croatia and Georgia, et cetera. These are the places that. Uh, in Eastern Europe, Western Asia that are being destabilized right now, which would put the power of the farming um, in this area that you were talking about over here, which would put it in direct control or at least in trade route with China, because that's their their uh, westernmost borders are all right there, too. And you see that you got the Golby Desert right there. Um, you, you can see how this. This, this is all in one line from Sudan. If you look at it, it it's like a new um, equator zone or grow zone, um, but it's not new. Like you were saying, it used to be that way already. Uh, matter of fact, when they would talk about the Hans moving, um, you know, coming into uh, Western Europe, that that uh, all of their horses began to get gout because of everything be, being lush and lots of greenery. And then when you look at these areas now, you wonder you know, what were they writing about? Because it's all arid desert now. Um, but why would they be investing in all of these places? And one example, I was uh, showing that mirror city, the line city or whatever they're calling it, the line city. Um, why would they be building these massive things? And if you look at their advertisement for this uh, wall city, in the inside of the city is lots of shops, apartments, hanging gardens. Um, they have vertical growing. Uh, they're even showing some Arab girl without a hijab jumping through a portal and flying around inside there like it's going to be the, uh, you know, the bee's knees. The, it's the next level of civilization. But why would these people be dumping billions and billions of dollars in supposed areas like this um, that doesn't really have anything but supposed oil when the world government is trying to pretend that we're going away from oil at the same time as the tycoons of the oil industry are not taking their billions and building in other countries as much as they're building right there in the middle of the desert. Um, and I was showing a picture of Dubai, uh, Dubai here. When you look at that, it looks like one of the most technological advanced cities on earth, which makes me always wonder if everything's being destabilized and diminished all over the world. And this is what you get to see. Like there's, you, you have to go out of your way to actually watch and see what's going on in Dubai. And what do you see there? You see next level technology being presented at their little, uh, you know, when they have their conventions there. We have the tallest building in the world there, which is a new, ta uh, in my opinion, that that's a direct uh, Tower of Babel thing that they made right there. And then not only that, if you look along the coast here, let me go back to uh Google Earth here, and you just zoom in, and you don't even try to find anything in Dubai. 
uh, what you'll see is all up and down the coast are these new, what they're calling the new wonders of the world. And why are they making these monuments? If you can see one of them here is the map of the United States, uh, South America, excuse me, North America, South America. They have a world map built into an island that they put there. Um, so what, are, what is the uh, message that they're trying to give there? Because this isn't something that they're really advertising to the whole world. Look, we're building a whole next level of technolo technological cities all through the Middle East and all these arid, dry areas. Um, they're not crazy. They have to know something, right? And what, what they know is that industry must be leaning towards going into these places because while they're building up, um, in these areas, they're tearing down in all of the, what we would call the old world. So um, is it that they know exactly where the areas are going to be of strife and the areas of good? And that's what they're doing is they're basically pulling the plug and trying to drain all the last remaining resources out of these areas that were uh, leading the world for some time um, because they recognize that these are not going to be the areas soon that are going to be uh, you know, full of resources, which makes you wonder what happens to us here in the United States um, if all of the resources are being put somewhere else. It tells you that uh, they don't really care what's going on here. And more than that, it seems like they would like to destroy what's going on here so that we can't ever be a power from this area again. And I, and I was kind of zoom in here to this area that you're talking about. Yeah, you explain and, uh, that well. You know why? Because you'd be wasting the resources now. There's nothing you can salvage if these cycles are inbound like this. There really is nothing you could salvage as a government knowing this, that whatever would happen is enough to put those countries. And I, as you were talking, I went to Google Earth and I spun the globe, like you said, to go through northern Saudi Arabia as the equator. And if you were to go east from there, it travels right through Kazakhstan, Xinjiang, Tajikistan, those exact areas. But if you go west... The equator would now be on the Sinai Peninsula going through what would be Libya and the Sudan, and that would be so incredibly lush that like 10 or 15 degrees off the equator would be Morocco in a lush, wet belt of Mauritania. So the whole northern part of Africa would be in the most lush grow zone you've ever seen in your life with the weather patterns. But if you were going to squander that and send it over to the states, which looks like it's going to be underwater, and you've seen those Navy maps where it goes up the Mississippi and like 100-mile sea in the middle between, you know, the Mississippi, what was bridges, they'll find those bridges in 5,000 years and wonder what they were. But those were the bridges going over the Mississippi as whatever landmass split and all those floods came in. They don't want to squander the resources. I wouldn't either. You know, I'm looking at it in a different way now. The supply chains are being slowed down to bring those resources for continuity elsewhere, but they don't want to waste any more of the resource on something that can't be salvaged. Also, I wanted to point out where in the world are the Earth's rare minerals? The rare earth minerals are all in this big strip right here. <laughs> That's also what you're talking about, where they're investing. Um, you know, we, we know they're pulling stuff out of uh, these areas like Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. Uh, a lot of these places are untapped mines of all of these rare earth elements. If you were going to start rebuilding a technological civilization, um, wouldn't it be in your benefit that the exact center of that is where most of the uh, resources needed to do all of these things are? Yeah, so here's another one. If you were to... to uh have all that you already knew it was going to go there on the spin so let's say it is a zero magnetic field from the sun there's a second magnetic field in the outer solar system because the gas giants lining up in their square configuration overlooping magnetic fields of those four gas giants creating an interlooping larger you know distorted toroid field it's not pure like it's coming from the sun it's just one looping field but when you get those jupiter saturn uranus and neptune in close proximity to each other those magnetic fields interacting themselves are creating a magnetic field. Now, whether the stabilization of that or whether that caused planets to glow and we start to see different stars, and those are the, you know, what they call the gods from the ancient accounts of the Greeks and whatnot, these planets more electrified, and they saw the same thing because it's 3,600 years ago. You know, some of these cycles are on that 3,600-year, 7,200-year cycle. So if you were back at one of these, what happens Maybe the Earth does move slightly at that point, and you know, 
I did have the new equator going across the Sinai Peninsula, transiting through Xinjiang, all the way across China, and looks like South Korea would be on the new equator if it shifted 90 degrees. Here's the scary thing. When you go across, all of the entire United States is the Arctic Circle now. I mean, it looks like 90 degrees would be right over, like Kentucky or something would be the 90 degree mark on the North Pole up there. I'm like, huh, you could see why they wouldn't want to use the resources. If you knew something like this would happen where an entire continent would get shifted into a frozen zone where it's uninhabitable, unusable, 0% return on it. But you would know where the oil fields were, so you could call it Arctic oil exploration, like perhaps we had the same maps. The same exact cycle happened to us on the last turning of this cycle, and now what we consider um, Arctic oil fields are just oil fields that were on the continent in a warmer area before there was actual geophysical planetary tilting. They don't want to use the resources for some reason. This area of the world has been earmarked for a complete loss, and whoever lives through it gets to rebuild it, and they're not even going to bother you for a while because it's all getting set up over on the other side. So think about the flip. British Empire took across the planet to gather resources, but there were consolidation seats of power in London, etc. There wasn't really seats of power in Papua New Guinea. You know, if you're thinking about that disconnect of how much was hands off at that point until the spice trade came through. But at that point, it was very much hands off. So that would have been a previous cycle of the reset of that time. So that's going back at least three of these mud flood resets that I'm talking about. So whatever happens, they they've just written this off and it, it will come back eventually for sure but between now and then you, know, you almost have to look at it as a business on the planet because i am always thinking that the earth is a farm jupiter ascending explains it very well earth is a farm for labor to export off planet or inner planet whatever resource that there would be there are overseers on the planet that then report to those that are off planet or under planet Jupiter ascending explained it really well. So when you start to look at it like this, how many cycles has it been through? And if it's a business running a farm, just like you are running a chicken farm or a cattle farm, you would have find something on an, maybe there's a disease that swept through and none of those chickens could be saved. So would you spend the money to give them the feed if you were going to cull them the next day? No, you wouldn't. You would look at that as an ROI thing and think, okay, 24 hours of feed, I could save for the next set of chickens. It would save me this much. Because what if you had 8 billion chickens? Okay. What if you only had one quarter of the world's chickens? You had 2 billion chickens. And you knew there was something that was going to happen the very next day and they would all be gone or the next weeks. Would you continue to... Put the input in. No, you would not on a business sense. So think about that, Ransom, because we talked about this earth being a farm. Business decisions off earth, let it go, let, let it happen, whatever happens, uh, let's shift the resources to the next place. You got it. You hit it on the head. Man, I'm glad we're recording tonight's episode. You know, it makes me wonder too, because when I'm looking at this, uh, I'm looking at Google Earth and I'm trying to you know, imagine this, uh, maybe not an equator per se, but at least a, a line through the earth that would be the center of everything. And, it, and all the places that you mentioned, including Saudi Arabia, Sudan, uh, et cetera, you could see that, that you could probably put a ley line map right over that and pick out all the, the ancient spots that people basically lived. I'm sure they're not going to build right on the exact spot because things change just a little bit, but it does look like it's on along the same line um, of the ancient line of things. And when you go around the earth like that, it makes you wonder um, what does this have to do with the changing magnetic poles? Um, because if you've seen some of the maps, uh, they place one what the North Pole somewhere around India or south of India, uh, would, and the uh, South Pole would be right off of the coast of Guatemala and Mexico, right, around, or at least a little south of there, maybe uh, north of Ecuador in the ocean there. And it's very bizarre that if you take that same line and just imagine that this would be like kind of a new center 
uh, of the planet, so to speak, not quite in the equator, um, but uh, center of importance, you can see that it, it just, you could draw a line right through all of the ancient civilizations um, from the new world to the old world. And it, it circles around through China, which I'm sure if you started looking at that line, you would start noticing areas like where all the pyramids are in China, things like that. They're all lined up on the same, um, I'm going to call it a ley line because it seems to be of some importance. Now, if you had maps of the way the ley lines change and you had a 26 to 52,000 year history in some, in some form, um, not unlike the Mayans had, then you might know exactly where the cycle would line up again whenever it completes or several times. And that would make it easy for, and if you think about that, it would make it easy for the uh, whoever's running things, the overlords, all the way back in time, as far as you can remember, where they knew where to set up these empires. It's not accidental that the empires show up where they do. Um, just like you were pointing out these ancient dams and stuff like that. Uh, that's because they were using it big time back then. So um, they must have known where to go. Or do you think they, that they just randomly happenstance? Because earlier you were talking about this cultural layer. Uh, and if you put the center of relevance of the world's grow zones on this line, you would find exactly that, what you were talking about. Right underneath would be the old civilization's cultural layers. Um, and it, you know, this gets, and if you look right here, you would find all of these ancient areas, the uh, Indus Aryan Valley, uh, most likely the, and then Turkey and all of this stuff, it would be right in this uh, row uh, around the earth. So it's not that far fetched to think that this would be the new center of attention for the planet's resources because it already was once. Yeah, you're right. That cultural layer, I'm looking at the desert in Xinjiang. And the cultural layer is over there. Okay, there was a disaster, and that previous, even now they have to dig out a lot of the ruins and the grottos and what they consider cave sculptures and Buddhas color, carved into solid rock were completely covered in sand, much like you might think the Sphinx was when Napoleon first found it. Totally covered in sand, completely up to the neck. They just barely saw the face, and then they excavated, and you got all that huge, gigantic other part of the body there. Well, it was just like that out in Xinjiang and a lot of these grottos and temples and things. Even now, there's just incredible amounts of buried cities out there. For anybody who likes to travel and you're an archaeologist or you just love visiting like ruined cities in the middle of a desert, you got three of them right there. Some of the biggest to ever exist. There are 200,000 people living in the cities. And they're completely under, well, what's now? It's inhospitable now to even go out there because most of these cultural layers that we know of are Somebody took over the same spot, and they're still in hospitable zones. But in the middle of Xinjiang Desert, uh, the middle of the Gobi Desert, maybe not. The middle of the Arabian Desert, probably not. But if you put that line, Ransom, like you did, and let's say the uh, equator goes across through the Sinai, across through Jordan, and then comes right over through Turkey and continues straight over to China. If you continue going east, you come into some very religious spots in in Korea, and then also Japan, a very heavy place of mysticism and following uh, the Big Dipper cult and the, uh, the stars of the Big Dipper, and they try to describe it as an energy current from the Big Dipper that gives human consciousness consciousness. It's a spark of consciousness comes from this whatever you want to describe it as that flow of something from that star to ours to give the human the ability to think and resonate and know that you're conscious. That's in Japan, and that is on the exact same line. But you would never want to build anything in these deserts. So their cultural layer is still there, but just nothing ever got built on top of it. So... It's like we skipped one whole iteration, and then if we were going to get built on, it'd be like an other, every other one. But there's some places on the planet, even after whatever type of shift, it's always in a hospitable zone, pretty hospitable zone, sort of hospitable zone, but always enough where people can instantly almost rebuild on top of it. So there's got to be a pivot point on the planet where it pivots around that one single point. It just doesn't go like random happenstance anywhere it wants to go it's on a pivot point and i heard the egyptians talking about this because even if you were to look at that ransom you can see where where the pyramids are even if it shifted they would stay almost in the exact same spot latitude wise 
You know, they, they didn't move very much. So the, the way that would shift, it's almost like that is the pivot point. Because when I shifted that, do that back and forth, that area on the planet doesn't even really move. It's pretty in the exact same spot almost. So knowing that you're yeah, on a pivot you, point you, on an anchor point, then there's only so many positions it can swivel to. So, you know, if you knew all the swivel points along a million years of transition or 100,000 years of transit, or even the last 25,000 years, that you knew that pivot point was the pyramids, that area, even if there were no pyramids there 20,000 years ago, which many say they were, that these pyramids are 30,000 plus years old, especially the Nubian pyramids. Nobody ever talks about those. But if that was the anchor point for the last procession of the equinox and everybody knew it, the 25,000 year motion in here off that anchor point, you for sure would know exactly where it's going to reset to this time. For sure. If it was a 400 year cycle or an 800 year cycle, you'd have hundreds of those to run through on a one processional cycle. For sure. You'd just see a flip flop, flip flop, flip flop, flip flop, flip flop. Okay, we're going to go back there this time. Yeah, it's uh, ironic, too, that this whole thing, uh, if you keep going around the globe there, you'll end up back into the Aztec and Mayan empires and the southwest of the, the United States, which is, when you look at the southwest, it's completely uh, dry compared to, you know, at one time they were living out there on rivers um, in these valleys. They were fishing and they were doing all kinds of stuff. And now it's some of the most arid areas uh, in America. Uh, it looks like the entire the entire loop around that would go right, like I was talking about, kind of like ley lines, and you would find all of the ancient civilizations on this new, um, I guess, uh, band of an influence around the globe, which would put a lot of the other growth. center of agriculture would have been more down into the Mexico area and less into the uh, south of the United States. Um, but it, it's bizarre. So how fast do you think something like that can change? Like um, one event, like let's say Mount St. Helens exploded um, with, with maybe only half of the force of Tunga there. And then you would have two things going. And I, and I wasn't suggesting that, you know, the earth is going to move or anything, but we know that patterns do change. And they're always talking about climate change, climate change. We might actually get to see some climate change if things were different as far as the uh, flow of the weather that there is now. Um, what What is the likelihood of, um, you know, cooling temperatures because of volcanic stuff changing weather weather patterns for a long time? I mean, because in the past, it seems like total civilizations have had to move because things just wouldn't grow anymore near them or um, they were they just couldn't live there because of the volcanic activity just made it unlivable. Um, and when you look at like Vesuvius and things like that, there was only 2000 people supposedly living in this little thing. And we get a picture of, um, you know, all kinds of life that was going on there. They had, uh, you know, extreme, extreme advanced um, culture there. And, and it was gone immediately. And no one ever really came back till modern times. And now we have big cities there. Um, but you can see the same thing. And I wanted to ask you about this. Co. you were talking about the Xinjiang, is that is that how you say it? The Xinjiang? Oh, Xinjiang. Um, Xinjiang, okay. Um, I noticed that there is a massive river there. What is this? The uh, it, it looks pretty dry, but it's the Hotan River. But you can see it from space as a massive river. And at the end of that, you know, you see these little green zones where people are growing and farming and stuff. Uh, and that's right in the middle of the desert. So if you can imagine some of these uh, rivers coming back to life, um, it, it, how long do you think it would actually take uh, for these massive areas of sand and stuff that have been built up over time to actually re revert to something that they could use for farmland? And I wouldn't even put it past, uh, you know, like the Chinese government to ship in soil from the other parts of their, their uh, country to uh, start new farmland. We have to realize there was an enormous amount of agriculture there before like that whole area what you think of if you're on google earth and you see the bottom part of that where it looks like a little u shape coming up uh if you get down in on the edge there it is full electrical discharge and you can see the uh 
was that dendritic ridges from the ionic wind pattern blast that you know those guys in the thunderbolts talk about the electric geology all the time if you are let me let me give me a couple coordinates uh 36 minutes 24 north 82 degrees 22 minutes east so 36 24 north 82 22 east and then zoom down in there and then go west and you're going to run into you know arc and discharge patterns uh what looks like you know bird feathers carved into the rock over 100 miles of supersonic winds blasting things in the same directional patterns and I did an entire video. If you just cross that one mountain range going west, you're going to come over into uh, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan. And they have these sacred mountain ranges all through there. The Lake, lake Isik is just littered. They must have seen the actual display in the sky because Isik Kul or Lake Isik, there's all these petroglyphs through the entire area, as far as you can see from Kazakhstan over to Xinjiang, they must have seen the blast wave because A, it was represented in their art. And if you scroll through and look around Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, you find blast wave patterns everywhere. This was a massive event of electrical discharge. So if you're asking how quickly it could happen, if it's an electrical event and not a geophysical pole event, but I think they're interrelated actually then the electrical event could scar discharge within seconds and by the within an hour your, your entire landscape has changed but you know i did spin the globe when we were looking at the google earth there and that's only like eight or nine degrees difference to the northeast to set that onto the new equator where all the ancient sites were like that wouldn't be a massive cataclysm like you stop the earth and all the oceans transit east to west over the continents this is like a mere bump to the northeast and nothing sloshes like that it's not a hard stop or in a restart in a different direction it's sort of just a bump and a nudge up eight degrees northeast and then suddenly it resets everything on the equator but it wasn't cataclysmic it was cataclysmic enough because there must be other events with it like ionic winds for example and I did an entire video on the Sulai um, and, uh petroglyphs where you could see they ran behind this mountain in the front of the mountain. I got melted in plasma, but behind they were hiding in these caves. And when they come out, they had all these shock patterns that they carved in the rocks for just its craziest archaeological site. There's like 10,000 rocks that are carved on out there up in this one valley where they're able to witness this event. They could see the wind flow. Crazy times, but uh, anyways, I know you're a fan of electric geology ransom. So if you go west, you are just you're going to be stuck on a map for the rest of the night looking at all the all the patterning that's happening. But if the wind changed even slightly, and that place started to fill just like it would in Tennessee, and then you got the first year of normal rainfall pattern, everywhere you look, that sort of green that's uh, being you know piped or farmed irrigation right now. You would connect all of that in one season. The only places that you couldn't farm would be in the middle of the middle of the desert. But what's so interesting, those buried cities out there, there's three gigantic cities in that Xinjiang basin. But being a basin, it's going to go become a lake again. So the middle of it, you wouldn't farm because it's going to become a massive lake. It's a depression like Great or like Death Valley is. So think about taking Xinjiang and that whole western desert and putting a uh, like a Tennessee rain pattern on it for two years or a year. What would happen? Man, you'd have the luscious, craziest agriculture back again because it's warm enough on that new equatorial. It wouldn't be exactly equator. It'd probably be like 10 degrees off the equator. But think of the lushness at 10 degrees north latitude or south latitude, what you can grow today. It's like super lush. So that was a long-winded answer to you, but I'm hoping you found some of that electric geology on the map, and that was a good way for you to lead into looking at all these different places. Yeah, I noticed uh, all the really – it is bizarre when you just think about it for a second that almost all, except for maybe minus uh, the, the Mayan and Aztec and uh, Olmec stuff, 
almost all of the rest of the stuff around the world is uh, either in remote covered jungle or it's in places that are completely arid and, and it's hard to imagine that they ever had uh, things going on there. Yet we see these giant cities out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, one example is like Mohanjo-Daro. Um, it's in the middle of nowhere and something happened that ended the river system there um, in northern India there. Like so you could go look and then um, that was lush green area too, obviously, because they had a massive city and a port and um, farming going on there. And then something happened. We don't know what happened. Whatever it was, it it left a radiation, uh, you know, presence behind. But now it's just completely arid sand and desert. Uh, nothing at all lives there. So you could just imagine that it that didn't happen exactly overnight, but whatever, you know, made it start happening must have happened very rapidly for all the people were gone all at the same time. And then it's just a forgotten city out there in the middle of nowhere. It makes you wonder how many more of these that they'll start finding once they start reusing the uh, land, uh, you know, for farming and other things. Because think about all of the discoveries that we've had so far in like Turkey and other places. Most of those all come from farmers just coming across stuff where they're trying to grow food. So that would have been two changes ago then, two cycles prior. Because you would have had to have the people that were there before what we consider now were the finders of their civilization. We're finding it now. So imagine if it does do a shift, like let's say an eight or nine degree shift to the northeast. They wouldn't be, it would be damaging for coastal areas in some, but it would be a slosh, not a full overrun. And you would get some inundation inland of waves, probably 10 to 20 miles inland, but that would be it. Everything else would just settle in place and there'd be new weather patterns form. It would be tumultuous. There'd be an enormous amount of, you know, out of place jet streams and it would be it would be weird for a couple of years. But I bet after like three years, two years, even probably faster, it's electromagnetic, that the cloud cells and the jet streams would find new forms really quick because they're following electro patterns and they're following electric currents in the crust. And they're following electric currents coming down to the pole and spreading through the crust and through the ionic layers of the atmosphere, all electric. So they're probably going to organize themselves pretty quick. That's not going to be like generally, okay, puff a cloud. Okay, now which way is it going to go? No, these entire weather systems on our planet are being driven electrically. So they're going to lock pattern pretty quick. And immediately you're, start gonna, you're going to get the new flows. So if it rains 100 inches a year, wow, guess what? You got agriculture. And you know, looking through just randomly some of these areas on the map, you know, there's an enormous amount of photos from people out there in the Lutu Desert at, or LUT Desert. You can see where the water actually came across. You can see the flood marks in it. It's a, you can see that this was a major overspill of a continent, which is not a light version of a nine degree tilt northwest. What I'm looking at here with the, with this kind of really crazy archaeology, or, uh, geology on it is a full stop restarting in a different direction that's a huge amount of the myths and legends those stories but on these smaller 400 800 2000 year cycles you could get a shift of eight degrees but sort of northwest northeast whatever it didn't bother that much but it did reset so what would people find 800 years from now because you know an entire forest can cover something in as little as 100 years, 200 years. You don't even know anything's been there. It grows back naturally. So, yeah, Ransom, you know, how many times have people been in today's world rediscovering the old world, which was one cycle before us? Like it'll happen again. Let's say we get the mud flood 2024. It takes, you know, eight years for society to sort of get back to our right, their stable areas now again. Weather patterns have resumed their flow during that time because that would be part of the chaos phase until everything stabilizes. Society restabilizes, weather patterns restabilize, and suddenly, uh, like planet overseers jump out and go, "Hey, you need to use our, use our new money system. We got a new another area here we can barter with, but you need to use this new money system." That's possible. What would they find after 800 years and what were the lies being told to the people finding it and were they lied to about the age of it? Because imagine if they find things of today. 
they're probably not going to find much of our modern society because glass and plastic and this kind of stuff will degrade pretty quickly. What if they're just refining the same artifacts we are of like Greek statues and they'll attribute it to us? They're just refining the same fine art again and again in the same areas or they, they if you knew a museum was there and you were going to falsify history you would pull out the artifacts put them in place oh we found this again oh this head of whatever it's the head of david and ransom brother <laughs> our own carved marble statues you know and they'll say it's from this time period they could falsify history and you know maybe it was 400 years ago but they whip out with some stone stone carved head from greece and suddenly it's a 2000 year old story who knows but they're going to find Wouldn't stuff again be? from our civilization, and they're going to find stuff from that one, too, that they're building on top of, and you'll get that cultural layer again, but one cycle ago. I think there might be a difference this time. It's in recent events, we've been destroying statues, almost as if they don't want people to find those later uh, and attribute it to the civilization right now. Because think about uh, when you look around the world in the past several decades, uh, from the Middle East to Europe to the United States, uh, statues have been coming down. Historical markers, things that mark time at a specific, uh, you know, year and kind of uh, show people what it, who it was, what they were about. All of those things are disappearing. So it's kind of unlikely certain kinds of statues will even be found. Uh, and think about that. Uh, go back to the Georgia Guidestone. That was obviously put there. It, with the seemingly intent of being around after some kind of, uh, you know, cataclysm where people would be able to go and read that. Now, somebody decided that that message they didn't want the world to know was out there or they didn't want the, the uh, world to know that, that there ever was a plan to reduce the population. I mean, imagine if you were the new rulers of a smaller population and you're trying to control history and then someone finds this thing that proves that there there was some kind of plan to reduce everyone down to a specific number. And then also, uh, what else does it did it say in that Georgia Guidestone was about how to, uh, you know, let nature grow on its own without humans. Um, and it almost sounds like that really is the reset uh, where they just want to re remove people from around the world and then set them up in the new places that they want industry and the new cultural layer to uh, be developed. It, it seems exactly that's where we're at. And it kind of makes you wonder, you know, and I'm not a super fan of the Anunnaki came down and made us and everything, but that is an option. It is kind of out there. Uh, but one of the weird things is how they wanted to collect all the gold. And then you think of right now, um, there's no way that you could physically look at or verify that Fort Knox had any gold or that our country had any gold. And then when you look over into the European uh, arena there, you have a state-sponsored uh, secret that you're not allowed to know the royal family, how much gold they have. Um, how would we even know if, uh, you know, rent was due, <laughs> so to speak, and uh, we paid the rent? It, you would think that immediately you couldn't have a, a financial system in any part of the world based on gold uh, with the secret knowing that they already gave away all the gold that there was stored up. Could be an illusion. Maybe they're leaving enough to restart a system. Because if you're looking at a cycle reset, you would know exactly how much you would need to start up. So think about banks that have gone out of business over the last, say, 200 years in America. They would know how much was lost, how much would be needed to start again, but then there would always be an additional amount of money or goods or something extracted off the planet. They would have to leave a store stash of it because, you know, it seems like some of these atoms and minerals, and when I say atoms, I mean like carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, like atoms, and gold itself and uh, silver, and other atoms that make metals, and those metals concentrate electrically and make veins in the crust. So here's where it gets a little woo-woo. Because if this change that I'm referring to in 2024 happens at the end of 2024, 
when we get into the second electromagnetic field or this magnetic field strangeness, there's going to be electrical discharge on the planet. And this discharge is what I believe is the precursor or the mechanism to start the mud flood or the global liquefaction event. Taking forms and shapes and thicknesses and materials all across the planet, but in different, I say, you know, thickness of medium, whether it be pure sand or it's pure mud or it's a mix between silt and clay or whatever it is, pure water. Electrically, plasma discharges and an electrification of the crust at this magnetic anomaly. Well, what does that mean to you and me? It means that when this electric anomaly happens to the planetary level, that all those singular atoms that are disconnected, that don't make a vein of minerals, suddenly all are attracted to each other and new massive veins of materials are then once formed. So right now, when you think about core samples, when you're getting an assessment on gold and as an owner of a gold field, they're doing a core sample and they're taking how many flecks of gold are in your cubic centimeter of rock or cubic meter of rock. And they'll say, well, there's this many flecks of gold in there multiplied by this much equals there's this many tons of gold under your land. But, but. We need to crack it apart and separate the gold and use all the chemicals and energy to mine it and everything. But electrically, if it was such a discharge on the planet, all that would come back together again and you'd have massive, huge, gigantic veins of gold once again. You would just need to know where the original gold fields were that have been mined out. Everything would cave in and re-electrify and it would be like nobody's ever been there before and it would come back together and then whatever new world emerges, they just start the process again. And then you're back to the veins, and then it's been another 2,000 years in the stories and this and that. So, you know, if you're looking at, you, you described like Anunnaki story, but when you look back, this Sumerian king's list, you know, some of these rulers were living to be 400,000 years old. So you got to think about even a 2,000 year cycle on earth, if you were going to extract the gold once every 2,000 years, but you live to be 400,000 years old. You wouldn't be really concerned. There, you, there would always be a little leftover for the next time to start the system again. That's the goal you're referring to, to restart the monetary system after this event happens. That's not 100% extracted for rent. They leave a little bit over for expenses. Well, I wonder how much we're going to see because uh earlier today i was uh looking at the uh twitter feed there and i i saw this uh story coming out of jordan uh where a guy took a rifle down to the bank because he had been going there for the past two months trying to withdraw money and they put a five thousand dollar cap on it uh, i don't know what the time period was i think it was every two weeks or something so he couldn't get any more out of that and I guess he had some kind of medical emergency with his uh, parent or whatever, and he wanted to get his money out of it. They've been denying him and denying him. And allegedly, he has like 300 k in there but can't get it out. So he got finally tired of it and went down to the bank to demand his money. Now, I'm, I'm wondering how much more of that we're going to see, and is that why um, basically they've hired 87,000 new IRS agents. Now, you were saying, you know, that's kind of scary, but not really on a, on a global thing. But uh, we've talked a lot about how things can change in a government to where they come and try to seize people's properties or tell them that they owe money that they may not owe. And are we getting into that time where the actual financial system is going to collapse in a, in a way that everyone can see it? And there will be a lot more of those guys like in Jordan that are down at the bank uh, demanding money that he can't get because it's not there and they won't let him have it. Yeah, you can see that happening around. And I was just, that's weird that you said that because I was working on that in a slide in my video for tonight. The new shekel, the withdrawal limit is 5,000 new shekels, but that's equivalent to $1,852, so 5,000, or no, sorry, 6,000 new shekels is equal to $1,852 at today's exchange rate. And that's the limit that you can buy anything in cash with. So that's in addition going on. And also in the UK, you have to show an invoice before you can get more than 2,000 pounds out of the bank. That's up today. 
so capital controls are starting to hit on the amount of available cash you can take out. Ransom Godwin, 420 TV Freedom of Films, and Mountain High, thank you for spending your time with me, and I hope everybody got something out of our talk tonight. David Dubai, signing off. Thank you for listening to Revolution.